In the next 40 minutes, we're diving deep into the secret arsenal of sneaky mix tricks legendary mixers like Chris Lord Algy, Jason Joshua, and Eric Valentine love to use. These are some of the masterminds behind world-class billboard charting mixes that captivate both artists and fans alike, creating an insatiable demand for more. I spent the past year exploring these groundbreaking techniques across several videos on this channel. And now for the first time ever, I've distilled all that knowledge into one comprehensive, easy to follow compilation video. These aren't just tips. These are game changers that will elevate your mixes from good to unforgettable. So whether you're a beginning mixer or a seasoned pro looking for new techniques to add to your repertoire, this video is a gold mine. And we're kicking off with sneaky stereo tricks pro mixers use to get wider mixes that hook you and audiences. I was at wit's end with my mixes sounding flat and one dimensional. It was as if my mixes were trapped in a small box. Oh, what's in the box? Unable to break free and push the boundaries of my speakers. I tried everything I knew to widen my mixes, from using stereo widening plugins to panning instruments all the way to the extreme left and right, but nothing seemed to work and I was getting frustrated. So I delved deeper to finding the missing puzzle piece to wider mixes that the mixers I admired were using to create those massively wide sounding mixes. What I found was nothing short of remarkable. These were some of the most straightforward yet mind boggling techniques I had never seen and they worked like a charm. And in this video, I'll show you how I broke free from that flat one dimensional mix hell I was in to achieving the wide mixes I coveted just like the pros, including one game changing technique that's so straightforward, you'll be kicking yourself for not trying it sooner. Let's start with probably one of the easiest tricks that mixers like Erko, Eric Valentine, and Andrew Sheps use often that I never thought about and overlooked. It all stems from their analog mixing experience. You see, back in the day, if a mixer wanted to use a piece of gear on a stereo track, they had to buy multiple units of the same gear. And just like how no two models of the same guitar sound exactly alike, each unit of gear had its own unique quirks and characteristics which helped to create space in a mix. Fast forward to today, and many mixers just slap a stereo plug-in on a track without giving it a second thought. But Andrew and Eric noticed that this wasn't giving them the width that they were used to. So they made a small change to their plugin selection. By setting the parameters for a basic starting point and then unlinking the channels, they were able to make the left and right channels independent of each other thanks to the power of multi-mono plugin instances. Suddenly instruments like overheads and room tracks opened up in their mixes. And with compression, this technique is a game changer. No more uneven compression because the left side or right side is having more energy and causing the other one to get ducked down. But Papa Valentine also has one more trick that is his secret weapon to gain that extra 5% of width within a track. Papa V's secret sauce involves using a simple pitch shifting plugin that is standard in most DAWs. By offsetting the left and right channels anywhere between five and 10 cents, he is able to get the tracks to spread their wings a bit more in a mix without sounding too out of place. And one instrument in a mix that really needs to spread its wings are vocals. We stare just a little too long. And when it comes to getting wider vocals, Leslie Brathwaite has a simple trick that as far as I could tell, only one plugin comes equipped with it right out the box. Leslie reaches for Waves H Delay, a plugin that has an onboard polarity flip for the left and right channels. This allows Leslie to get an extra 5% of separation on his delays within the track adding an irresistible width to his vocals within the mix. But if you don't have H delay, don't fret. You can use a stock plugin that allows you to use that powerful multi-mono processing. Unlink the left and right sides, and with the multi-mono plugin with the polarity switch, flip the polarity on either side you desire. And if we're talking about wide mixes, of course the Lord of the Mix, Chris Lord Algae, is gonna come up. CLA has two big rules. One, there are no rules, and two, make it exciting. And let me tell you, CLA isn't one to hold back when it comes to ranting about anything in a mix that bores him. One of the hallmarks of CLA's sound is the wide vocal delay he is able to achieve without losing the singer in the mix. Now, how does he do it? Well, he also uses a multi-mono trick that involves setting his stereo delays to the tempo of the track and then offsetting one side by seven to 20 milliseconds below the tempo of the track and then the other side seven to 20 milliseconds above the tempo of the track. This gives CLA a wider delay spread between the stereo image, but that's just one widening trick that CLA uses. Another staple of CLA's mixes are his drums, and especially the amount of width and depth that he gets from them. The 
the way CLA gets more spray in his drums is actually from a simple method of natural panning and balance. CLA is an LCR mixer, which means he likes to pan things hard left, hard right, or in the center. Yeah, John, no duh. Yeah, I know, but trust me, when I stumbled across why and how his hard panning and balancing of drums create wider mixes, by using our own ears against us and fooling us into thinking they're wider, it blew my mind. CLA uses the natural spacing of the overheads and rooms to get the initial sense of width by balancing the hard pan cymbal and tom mics just enough so that the attack is felt, allows those spot mics to become more present within the stereo image of the overheads outside of the blend. Our ears will sense the attack of the drums coming outside of the stereo image of those overhead and room tracks. This is what tricks our brains into thinking the drums are sticking a little bit outside of the stereo field. Now, Jason Joshua is a mixer you may not think about when it comes to wide mixes, but Jason Joshua came across a mixing trick that helps give drums more of the console width that mixers like Manny Mariquin, CLA, Andy Wallace, and so many others take advantage of, which is a byproduct of how analog consoles work. But I don't have a hundred grand to spend on a console. So when Jason broke down his drum whining trick in a mix breakdown, at first I laughed because of how ridiculous it looked. You can't be serious. Then I tried it, my jaw dropped, and the laughing stopped. Jason calls himself the king of saturation, and this trick lives up to the name he's dubbed for himself. By utilizing serial saturation via multiple instances of Waves NLS to create a saturation widening cocktail. Yeah, who would have thought saturation could be used for widening? Huh? Who would have thought? Not me. In Pro Tools, set up a master track that is assigned to the drum bus and use the following settings with the instances of Waves NLS and have a listen for yourself. And to make my life easier, I'll throw all the instances of Waves NLS into Blue Cat Audio's patchwork so it just takes up one insert space. And you know what? There's one instrument no one ever thinks to give some widening love to. What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? Bass. What? Usually the advice is you don't want to spread your bass. But Jacob Hansen didn't listen to the naysayers and instead came up with a way to get the bass wider within a track without screwing up the low end imaging that makes mixers around the world scared for their lives. Where Dwight? Seems like you already know where. Jacob's bass widening trick is simple. Send a signal of the bass to a stereo aux and on the aux tracks, use a filter to roll off to about 400 Hertz. This will focus the pick note attack of the bass. Then adding a reverb plugin after, which will help add more depth and spread to the bass. With the drums playing, Jacob will bring up the volume of the bass spread until the bass sits deliciously in the sweet spot with the attack of the drums, giving more life and width to the rhythm section. Just say when. Just say, serious, seriously? Are you ser- are you serious? Having wider mixes has definitely helped me escape the dreaded one-dimensional mix box I was stuck in, but there are some tricks pros rely on to get them the chart-topping mixes we all want for ourselves. Which is why you'll want to watch this video right here for some more sneaky tricks professional mixing engineers use to hook listeners. For years, I chased the perfect low end for my mixes, but no matter what I tried, my efforts fell flat. I knew I had to do something. I needed to uncover the secret that the pros knew. And what I discovered were some surprising tricks that the pros use to achieve their low end results. And in this video, I'm gonna share some of these tricks, including one that left me feeling skeptical it was just hogwash until I tried it for myself and I couldn't believe the difference. As I delved deeper into understanding the low end of the industry's top mixers, I discovered a trick that I would have never imagined, championed by none other than Andrew Sheps. One of the most respected mixers and educators in the business, Andrew's secret weapon utilized a tool that at first glance seems like a one-trick pony, but it's a trick that he often uses in combination with his signature channel set plugin with Waves, the Sheps Omni Channel. The Sheps Omni Channel is a unique hybrid plugin, and one of its most surprising features for a channel strip is not one, but two full band DSers along with a sidechain option that could trigger the de-essers. Andrew's trick utilizes the narrowband option on one of the de-essers to have the de-esser de-ess. Say that five times fast. The bass guitar gets momentarily de-essed at the kick drum fundamental frequency via the sidechain. This gives more breathing space for the kick drum. As I tried this technique for myself, I couldn't believe the difference it made. It was like a veil had been lifted from my mix, revealing a whole new level of sonic depth clarity, and punch to my low end. Now I gotta tell you about when I was working with Bo Burchell, 
Bo and I were no strangers to difficult mixing sessions, and often we'd get sent tracks that were less than ideal. And let me tell you, the bass can be a real pain in the neck, especially in heavier genres where you need the tight low end. It was really tough when the artist had already left for tour, and getting the bass retracted and sent over wasn't a possibility. But of course, Bo had a trick up his sleeve that is so simple, yet so effective that it can tighten up any mix in no time. Bo would run the bass through Melodyne to get the mini data he needed. Then he would use a bass library like Punk Bass to get a virtual bass. Bo would then roll off everything except the low end of the bass notes on the virtual bass instrument, and then use a high pass filter on the real bass until the two basses blended together perfectly. This helped to get a much more predictable and tight low end. And its impact is especially felt when the entire band comes in on the choruses and breakdowns. Speaking of bands, Picture this, you're mixing a rock or indie band, but the bass player is stubbornly sticking to their mid or higher register. It sounds great for the song, but it leaves the mix feeling weak in the low end, and using a synthesized bass in a rock or indie track is going to stick out like a sore thumb sometimes. It's frustrating, right? But legendary producer and mixer Eric Valentine has a trick up his sleeve that will have you getting that bottom end that rumbles in no time. Papa Valentine starts by duplicating the bass DI and throwing a plugin like Waves GTR to utilize one of the pitch shifting pedals inside. This isn't your ordinary pitch shifter. Oh no, this bad boy is an octave pedal, dropping the bass down an octave lower. The result? A massive low end that will fill the gap needed in the track. But that's not all. To really drive the point home, Papa Valentine follows up with the Resident EQ plugin like Little Lab's Voice of God. It's like adding rocket fuel to an already blazing fire, creating that thunderous low end that sounds like a rocket shooting the space. Papa Valentine will then chop up this modified bass DI and drop it in during the song's big moments, any part that is begging for some added weight. Do it, Quill. I can take it. No, he can't take it. Now I'm curious if you've had this same experience when mixing the low end. You sit down, you start to dig in, you're in the zone just getting the whole mix together, but you keep coming back to the low end. Your bass sounds muddy and your kick drum is lacking punch. You try everything you can think of and nothing seems to work. You find yourself with signal chains like this and this on your kick and bass guitar. Sadly, this is where I found myself countless times as well. I eventually stumbled across a subtle tip that the Lord of the Mix Chris Lord Algae had mentioned in a mix breakdown that absolutely blew my mind. As a mixer, I would get the session files and I would check to see if the tracks were aligned, in tuned, and if the drums were in phase, and then I'd just start mixing. But one part I often overlooked was checking the polarity and phase between all the bass instruments in the session to ensure they were all working together so when the low end information hit the speaker cones, it was all going in the same direction. Otherwise, the bass instruments would be canceling each other out and leading to some of the craziest signal chains we can come up with. And I couldn't talk about low end without talking about the mixer behind artists like The Weeknd, BTS, and Pharrell, to name a few. Three-time Grammy winning mixer Jason Joshua. When it comes to low end, he's a magician, capable of conjuring up some deep guttural bass that will make your head spin. His secret? A trick so gnarly looking, you might think he's joking. <laughs> <laughs> but trust me, it's no joke. Jason's bass saturation trick is set up by having all the bass tracks go to a bass auxiliary set. He then has a master track assigned to the bass auxiliary track. And like a mad scientist, Jason has not one, not two, not three, but seven, yes, seven instances of Waves NLS. I warned you, this was going to be ridiculous. What's this mother with this serial saturation processing, Jason is able to glue the bass and get it more up front and wider all at once within a mix. But if you're like me, I just throw all the instances of NLS into patchwork, so it just takes up one single plugin insert slot. So Michael Brower is a legend in the mixing world, and his career spanning over two decades has allowed him to pick up a couple of incredible mix tricks. One of his tricks is so simple yet incredibly effective that it can help control the low end of the kick drum and the bass guitar without the need to retrain EQ or compression at the start. Michael employs the use of transient designers to alter the sustain of the kick and bass tracks when needed. But the downside to traditional transient designers is they affect the entire full band spectrum of the instrument they're being used on. Instead, using plugins like Oak Sound SPIP or Audiosoft's Multitransient can more accurately dial in the low end sustain of the kick and the bass tracks, giving them the perfect balance to gel together. Now, a massive low end is essential for any mix to stand out from the crowd, but there are a plethora of tips and tricks that the top mixers use 
to make their mixes truly shine, which is why you'll want to watch this video for some mind-bending tricks that you'll want to put in your mixing toolbox right away. The Mix Bus It can be considered the most important part of any mix for a mixer. As the saying goes, you live and die by what you put on your mix bus. And for years, I mimicked what I read and saw as the staple go-to chains for a mix bus. But I was always left feeling devastated that my mixes just didn't have the same energy as the mixes I had loved. So I went on a quest to figure out what tricks the pros were using on their mix buses that I wasn't. And what I found were some not so traditional ways some of the pros I admired were using their mix bus to enhance their mixes. And in this video, I'm gonna share what these sneaky mix bus tricks are, including some that utilize a technique that actually borrows from a process that some mastering engineers use themselves. Now get ready to add some excitement and width to your mixes with this first subtle mix bus trick. Eric Valentine, the mixer behind artists like Weezer and Good Charlotte, swears by it. And the best part, it's one of the simplest mix bus tricks out there that anyone can start using right away to set themselves ahead of the competition. Papa Valentine loves to kick off his mix chain with an instance of wave center and then automate the sides to increase by half a dB on the choruses and sometimes bridges. This little boost increases the width of the track and gives the listener a rush of excitement. It's seriously so freaking simple. And no one likes to keep things as simple as the lore of the mix, Chris Lord Algae. CLA is famously known for boasting about using his beloved Focusrite Red 3 compressor on his mix bus in every mix. But when I studied CLA's workflow like I was prepping for the SATs, I discovered something surprising. Turns out there are a few other compressors that CLA likes to use at the mix bus stage. In fact, on his own Mixdown plugin, there are two different compression flavors to choose from. Flavor 1 is the classic CLA Red 3 sound we all know and love, but Flavor 2 is the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor that CLA uses on slower tempo songs or dance style tracks. But wait, there's more. I am very, very sneaky, sir. I see that. CLA also has two sneaky compressors up his sleeve. One is an SSL VCA style compressor that lives in his rack right below his Red 3, and the other is the SSL Jeepcon compressor on his SSL console. In a breakdown of his mix on Muse's Survival, CLA let it slip that the band felt like something was missing. Muse wanted a more in-your-face rock mix that would have the listener transport themselves to imagine seeing the band live. So CLA pulled out one of his tricks and combined the SSL Jeepcom compressor on the desk with his trusty Red 3 compressor to get a more upfront mix. And by combining these two compressors, it helped give the mix a more in-your-face rock angst sound that Muse was looking for. Muse was happy, and most importantly, CLA was happy. We got hits. So you can't mess with us. Anyway, that's how we operate here. Now get ready to mix like a boss with this next sneaky trick from the mastermind behind bands like Lamb of God and Every Time I Die, Machine the Producer. And the best part, it's easy peasy, thanks to the flexibility of mixing in the box. But beware, if your mix isn't already well balanced, EQ'd and compressed, this won't fix any of those pre-existing problems. In fact, it's gonna make them worse. <clears throat> What's wrong with you? I'm sick. I don't know why. Have you considered the 60 inch diameter cookie you're reading? <laughs> How can something that's delicious make me sick? In an interview, Machine shared how he was trying to figure out how one of the mastering engineers that he had been working with was able to get his master so loud without losing the punch or transient material in the mix that some other mastering engineers were destroying just a little bit when trying to get the master as loud and competitive as possible. The mastering engineer shared with Machine the routing setup that allowed him to maintain the punch and mixes that he was sent to master, which Machine found absolutely brilliant and has since incorporated into his mixing as now a staple of Machine's mix bus processing. What the master engineer had told Machine was the secret of him being able to maintain as much transient information as possible was using stems for mastering instead of the stereo mix. Wait, 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 hold up, John. How is stem mastering going to help me with mix bus processing? See, this setup allowed the master engineer to route drums, vocals, snares, or anything outside of the standard mastering chain to reintroduce more of the natural transients and dynamics of those instruments. Free your mind. Machine's mix bus is now a two-part process. First, there's a standard mix bus with processing where all the instruments get sent to. And second, there's another stereo aux channel with no processing running in parallel. Both of these stereo channels are then sent to a final master output with no processing. Once Machine has mixed a song to about 80 to 90% of where he wants it to be, he'll send various instruments to the outside mix bus and automate the send based on the needs of the mix for any given part of the song. That's the secret, an inside-outside mastering chain that Machine made his own. Holy crap. 
right. Pretty sick, right? Parallel processing isn't just for squashing drum buses anymore. Now hold on to your mixing desks. You'll love this sneaky mix bus trick from Grammy-winning mixer Tony Maserati, who's worked with artists like Tom Morello and Weezer and has his own line of plugins as well. Needless to say, Tony knows a thing or two about making a mix pop. Simple. I mean, I wake up in the morning, I piss excellence. Tony has an exciting way to utilize the power of parallel processing on the mix bus and add something I think all mixers always want in their mixes, weight and width. In Tony's mix template, the entire mix gets summed to a single stereo bus signal, and that signal is split into one mix bus that has Tony's typical mix bus processing, but the magic lies in the parallel mix bus signal that the mix is sent to that has an instance of Brainworks BX Digital V3 or Waves S1, which is adding stereo width followed by a vintage RS-124 compressor like Waves RS-124. There is a limiter at the end of this parallel chain as well to serve as an insurance that the signal doesn't push the final master output a little bit too hot. Tony then blends the parallel track, which adds more weight and width, and he'll automate it on as an as-needed basis instead of just having it on statically the entire time. Nice. This one is such a great and sneaky way to get your mixes even bigger and will have the competition ask themselves, how does he do? I bet your brain has probably exploded with these mix bus tricks that showcase exciting ways pros think outside the box to get the results that keep their artists and fans listening to their songs over and over again. And you'll probably want to know what other tricks the pros use in their mixes that give them a competitive edge, which is why you'll want to watch this video right here for some sneaky tricks the pros use to hook listeners. Vocals, arguably the most important thing in any mix and the toughest to get right. For years, my vocals just wouldn't come out the way I hear them on records that I loved. So a little like Alice Through the Looking Glass, I stepped through the door of mixing vocal secrets the pros use. And after falling through endless amounts of tricks the pros have up their sleeves, I landed on a few that changed my vocal mixes overnight. And in this video, not only will you know what these tricks are, but you'll know the one that was a complete game changer that I had overlooked for years, and you've probably overlooked as well. First trick on this list that I stole from Chad Blake, who has worked with artists like Switchfoot all the way to U2. Chad keeps his profile on the low in the industry, but his results are anything but that. And this trick that Chad pulled out really helped with one of the biggest nightmare issues I dread whenever I'm sent a project. There isn't any worse feeling than importing the files for a mix, going to check out the vocal, and you discover the one thing that can make you sweat in your chair faster than the Roadrunner from Looney Tunes. The dreaded thin vocal. Could have been the mic, could have been the engineer used too much EQ on the way in, but now you've got a thin vocal, and naturally the first thought is to boost the low end, right? But that just brings up the noise floor along with it. I mean, you can't boost something that isn't there. So when I saw in a video, Chad was using a plugin that I'd only seen other mixers use on drums, well, up until that point, my fear of thin vocals immediately went away. It's a simple yet creative way to help bring more chest quality to a thin vocal. Chad was using Devil Lock on thin sounding vocals to give them more distortion and saturation so the harmonics would create a pleasing full chest like quality to that vocal. Keep the crush at zero with the crunch and the darkness at around three with a fast release and dial the mix to taste. But we're not done with Devil Lock just yet. After seeing Chad use Devil Lock in this way, it seemed like all of a sudden I was seeing it being used in other creative ways by other mixers. Kind of like when you get a new car and all of a sudden every car on the road looks like yours. And it should come as no surprise that Eric Valentine, the mixer who gave us Queens of the Stone Age songs for the deaf and Taking Back Sunny's Louder Now, would have some cool tricks for Devil Lock on vocals himself. A few years back, Papa Valentine was doing a mix breakdown of Keith Urban's Horses, and in this video mentioned how he loved using Devil Lock to get the vocal up front and aggressive in a mix. To do this, start with the crush at about 0.5 with no crunch or darkness, and then the release set to fast, and again, dial that mix knob to taste. These tricks have really come in handy with some wimpy sounding screams that need to sound more like Godzilla fighting King Kong. The next trick is from Greg Wells, who's worked with artists like 21 Pilots and All American Rejects. In an interview, Greg mentioned one of his favorite tricks to do with saturation plugins mimics a workflow many engineers will do with outboard gear while tracking, where the engineer will push the preamp a little bit more in certain parts to get a hair more harmonic distortion, vibe, and character. Greg replicates this technique with a modern approach that allows for more flexibility without the fear of possibly distorting the performance while tracking. Greg likes to automate the amount of drive he is using on the saturation plugins on a vocal for certain parts, like a pre-chorus, a chorus, even a bridge, so that the vocal gets a little bit more angsty like a rebellious teenager. You're gonna have to kill me! But in a less dramatic and desirable way. 
I mentioned earlier the dread of finding out a vocal performance is a little thin sounding when you're reviewing the session, but that isn't always the case and after you check the vocals to see if any more tuning or time alignment needs to be done, it's off to the races and you get to mixing. So you start throwing some EQs and compressors on the vocals, maybe some delays and reverbs, and as the mix progresses, you start to notice something that is happening to those vocals in your mix. All of a sudden the vocals need a lot of automation, even with the compression, and your compressor might be working overtime and just ready to quit. Before you know it, the vocals aren't working in the mix, you've added another limiter and maybe some EQ and who knows what else, and your vocal mix is just shit. This would happen to me like a lot. Like a lot, a lot. <laughs> you serious? Luckily, this all changed for me after I watched an interview where Chris Lordology gave a great piece of advice. The first thing I learned is that listen to the boss and it's all about discipline and you know nothing. No, this advice. It doesn't matter. I can filter f delays and harmonies and shit till the sun goes down, whatever. Uh, okay. Well, it doesn't sound like a Neve. It doesn't sound like an API. Well, you know what? Go f yourself. CLA seems to have some strong feelings about that. All right, in all seriousness, CLA's little trick was, well, a few tricks that create a finishing fatality vocal combo like if it was Mortal Kombat. So if you know CLA, you know he loves his analog gear on vocals for its character and flavor. And a staple of CLA's vocal workflow is CLA pushing a channel's 8K on his SSL 4000E series console that goes into one of his Blue Stripe 76s, which I'm sure almost everyone and their moms know by now. Well, duh. But there is something before all of this that CLA does to ensure that he isn't fighting the vocal in a mix once it hits his chain. And I swear it's going to change your vocal mixes faster than getting a pizza delivery from Spider-Man. Pizza time. A key to CLA being able to use the EQ and compressor for its character to cut through a mix is CLA takes the time to check every vocal line sung by the vocalist is living in the same range so that any given vocal won't push any of the signal chain past its desired threshold. This creates consistency in the performance pre-compressor so he can get more character, color, and attitude from the compressor. When this isn't done, it leads to overly squashed and sometimes a distorted vocal compression sound and a bunch of overmixing trying to correct all of this. The way CLA adjusts the vocal performance pre-processing is by normalizing the audio or using clip gain on the vocals. But this is just one of three parts to this process. The second thing CLA does is find all the breaths in the performance and manually adjust the gain on these parts anywhere between negative nine or negative 12 to where the level was set for the normalization or clip gain of the vocal performance. This way the breaths still sound natural with the compressor and the rest of the performance. All right, and come close for this third one because this one can also help on things other than vocals in your mix. The third little thing CLA will do to help if a vocal is a little too pokey, like that porcupine in your backyard, Ooh. Yep. There. is using an instance of L1 before the SSL console EQ to tame the peaks before they hit that AK boost on the console, creating a smoother top end before the compressor. Can you feel that? That's your vocal mixing stonks going up. <laughs> Now this next trick from Dave Pensado is a staple of his mixing. Dave uses this trick to help with a problem I think every mixer shares. When mixing a vocal, once we start adding the goodies like delay and reverbs to create interesting and catchy vocal spaces, something happens that causes us to go back, automate vocals, or use limiters to get the vocal up front again. But sometimes, no matter how much automation or limiting we do, the vocal will still get lost. And Dave's trick helps to eliminate this issue and get that vocal right up in front and center where it belongs. Using a stereo parallel bus on the vocal that has an 1176, which helps push the vocal up. Set the input and output to about 24 with the medium tack, fast release, and a four to one ratio. Then throw an L1 after the 1176 so it shaves off the peaks and keeps the vocal level. This parallel bus has become a staple in my own production and it gives you that coveted pro vocal sound. They'll have your artists and their fans kneeling at your mixing awesomeness. We're not worthy! We're not these are really great tricks to have in your mixing toolkit, but aren't enough by themselves to give you the mixes to set you apart from the competition. Which is why you'll want to watch this video right here for some more tricks pro mixers have up their sleeves that you'll want to use in your own mixes. The hardest instrument to get right in any mix is always the dreadful snare. I buy every plugin and drum sample I see the pros use, and for years I still struggle to understand why my snares continue to sound terrible. After all this time and making zero progress, I felt defeated and was ready to walk away from mixing. But before giving up, I gave it one more shot. I studied every mix video I got my hands on even closer and started to notice some of the tricks pros were doing. Once I started applying these tricks in my own mixes, 
Overnight, my mixes were sounding better and I gained the confidence to continue pushing forward. And by the end of this video, not only will you know what these tricks are, but you'll also know about the one thing I was doing that was secretly ruining my mixes that you're probably doing too. This first trick is a great one and technically a few tricks in one. Each step helps get the punch and a snare we all desire while also allowing for depth and space. I picked this technique up from the mixer behind bands like System of a Down and Linkin Park. It's a great technique for a modern, aggressive, punchy snare sound. It's the art of not over compressing so that the snare transient is allowed to poke out a little bit. I'm talking like 3 dB of compression with the 4 to 1 ratio. Once we've got our snare where we want it, the next thing we'll need to do is use a snare sample to trigger the snare reverb. But the sample has a little more length, which is key, and you'll want to use the real snare to trigger the gate on the snare sample. If the snare sample is too short, then you'll be artificially extending the reverb decay, which can make the drum sound less realistic and works against letting the natural punchiness of the snare cut through. Use the gate to manipulate the length of the sample with the reverb. This trick from Andy Wallace just demonstrates why he's able to achieve such beautiful in-your-face snare sounds in some of the most beloved rock records of all time. But before you run off and steal this powerful trick, it's important to really get a handle on another technique that I found incredibly intimidating when I started recording music. Luckily over time, my ears got better and I became more comfortable with this technique. But I soon discovered, like Alice in Wonderland, the rabbit hole goes much, much further. When I saw one of my favorite mixers take this technique to another level I hadn't seen anywhere else before, my mind was blown. We're all taught to always check the phase and to flip it to make sure the drums are working together nicely. But this trick takes all of that to another level. The snare is the center of our mixing universe. And when I saw Tom Lord Algae not just flip the phase, but move the rest of the drum mics to phase and time align with the snare drum, it was like walking into the world of mixing Narnia. This gives the snare the spotlight and the punch it needs to cut in any mix because all the drum tracks are supporting the snare. And if doing this by hand in your DAW is too scary, there are plugins like Auto Line and Evo In to make this a bit easier. Phase is so incredibly important, but it's just so damn scary. But once it clicked, there was something else I realized that I was doing incorrectly out of habit. It was the culprit behind so many terrible mixes I had done and one that you're probably doing too. I remember when I first started reading mixing books, magazine articles, and watching mixing tutorials, I was taught to constantly do this. I mean, this technique is incredibly helpful and should be used whenever possible to create headroom and space in a mix, but with certain instruments like drums, this technique can really ruin everything if the mixer isn't 100% aware of the dangers when using it. It's like a mogwai like gizmo. Seems sweet and harmless, but if you don't know the rules, you'll end up with gremlins in your mix. While I was watching a mix overview video, I noticed something CLA said. Now here's the thing, I had watched this video multiple times in the past, but it didn't click until phase clicked. He was avoiding this technique as well on drums because he understood that drums were all part of a bigger picture. Using filters can create phase issues when it comes to drum mixing and can really mess up the impact of the drum mix, which is why CLA prefers using shelving EQs on drums instead of filters. Using shelf EQs helps avoid damaging the phase relationships between the drum mics. Remember, the snare is just one part of a much larger group of instruments that make a whole instrument. And filters can really start to screw up the phase of a kit if you're not careful. Phase really helps bring drums together, and the next trick is pretty straightforward now that you've unlocked your new Phase Plasma superpower like in Bioshock. But Phase goes even deeper. Remember when I said Phase was like a rabbit hole? But I soon discovered, like Alice in Wonderland, the rabbit hole goes much, much further. Well, this next trick is really helpful in creating a natural punchy snare in your drum mix without needing additional samples. You're probably doing something like this but haven't had much success. Next time you duplicate your snare track, duplicate all the plugins in the chain as well because maintaining phase coherence is gonna make this work. Now if your snare needs more low end punch, use the same plugins in their duplicated track but alter the EQ frequencies. Need more top end? The same process. This is gonna help you maintain the phase relationship with the duplicates and allow you to use the recorded snare a lot more in the drum mix before reaching for that sample. This is a super easy to do trick Papa Valentine uses often in his mixes to help reduce the need of samples. All these techniques are great at getting the snare to be as punchy as possible, but this next one is a complete game changer. Once I started working with my mentor Bo Burchell, who you may recognize from his band Seosin, and also having worked on records with bands like Era and Census Fail, there was a trick he was using to get punchy and clean snares in his mixes that utilized a lot of tricks in this video, but in a way I've never seen anyone else do. The technique is pretty simple. You duplicate your snare track and whatever processing you have, move down one insert so the first insert allows for a compressor. You'll need the highest ratio, fastest attack and release settings, and the threshold so the top end of the snare is being compressed. 
We're gonna use the compressor as a limiter, but this trick won't work with limiters. At the end of the duplicated track signal chain, you'll need just a regular stock EQ and start with the high pass filter around 700 hertz and then flip the phase. With this trick, you're essentially phase canceling out the top end with the EQ and the compressor is quickly ducking each time the snare gets hit. This creates the most organic, natural sounding gate I've ever used or heard. I promise you, once you try Bose snare gate trick, it'll be really hard not to use it in every mix. But all these tricks are useless unless your mixes are emotionally captivating the artists and their fans become addicted to listening to the songs you've mixed. Which is why you'll want to watch this video right here for some sneaky tricks the pros use to hook listeners. My dream for as long as I can remember has been to become a pro mixer, like Chris Lord Algae, Eric Valentine, and so many more. I'd wake up inspired to practice mix after mix on my quest to becoming one of them, only to play back my mixes time and time again and have to admit to myself, they sounded like absolute garbage. I dreaded the idea that I'd have to accept that I may never achieve my dream. But before I gave up on my dream, I decided to study my favorite mixers to find what they were doing that I wasn't. What I discovered surprised me. Pros have some tricks up their sleeves that they use in their mixing. And by the end of this video, you'll know these same tricks that will change your mixes overnight and you won't have to experience the dread of almost giving up on your dream like I did. First pro on this list is Manny Mariquin, who has worked with artists like Blink-182 all the way to Post Malone. Manny also has the most Grammys out of any one of the pros on this list and a signature line of plugins from Waves. He's been one of the best mixers for nearly two decades with no signs of slowing down. And just like every artist learns from their producer and every producer learns from their artist, mixers also learn from the artists they're mixing. In an interview on Pensado's Place, Manny spoke about working on Burn It Down from a little band called Link Lincoln Park. One of Lincoln Park's vocalists, Mike Shinoda, gave him a piece of production insight that Manny has since incorporated into his mixing. It's such a simple technique with a tool we're already using. In the interview, Manny spoke about how Mike was using filters over certain sections of the song to make them sound tamed. The filters would get bypassed by the time the chorus, bridge, or pre-chorus hit on whatever instrument it was on for a full spectrum sound. Just to remove enough top end and low end so you still get the effect of an entire spectrum. Then when the chorus hits, automate the EQ to turn off. The full spectrum of music will hit the listener more than it did before, which gives perceived epicness and depth. Andrew Sheps is another accomplished mixer who has worked with artists like Green Day and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Andrew's won a few Grammys and has his own line of plugins with Waves as well. In an interview I watched many years ago, Andrew gave insight to a really amazing trick that I personally always wondered how mixers achieved it. In the interview, Andrew says he uses deverb to create an endless reverb decay. This never ending decay acts as a way to help transition from one part of the song to the next. Next time you have a vocal coming out of a bridge or perhaps the ending of a chorus, max out the decay of your reverb and automate it to fade away as the new section of the song begins. You can also add an EQ to spice up the impression that the decay is fading into the background of the mix. You know this song from Shrek we all love? Some. The producer and mixer behind artists like Smash Mouth, Queens of the Stone Age, and so many more is none other than Eric Valentine. His attention to detail creates natural organic nuances within his productions that all sound imperfectly perfect. Is that even a phrase? One of the tricks that hooks listeners isn't going to have your head spinning. The payoff is a subtle ear candy that the listener can't help but rock out to just like the party scene in Shrek. In one of the YouTube videos on Papa Valentine's channel, he talks about how adding emphasis on the downbeat of the kick drum on each measure just by a few dB will give a perceived impact of the groove moving forward. This is such a brilliant move and will have listeners magically dancing to the tracks you mix like you put a spell on them just like in Hocus Pocus. I put a spell on. I mean, is there anything more addicting than when a song makes you want to rock your head to the groove of the track? Yeah, didn't think so. Chris Lord Algae is regarded as the lord of the mix. I mean, he gave you this mix. And this one. No, God! Kidding, I know a lot of people wish the second one never existed, but I couldn't pass on the joke. Anyways, Chris Lordology or CLA is pretty much the gold standard of mixers, just like Coca-Cola is the standard of soda pretty much everywhere. Sealy has his plugins with waves, his own monitors. Heck, Sealy even has his own brand of workout supplements. You got me. The workout supplements aren't his, but when it comes to mix gains, CLA can outbench everyone. One of the things I picked up from my search was a mix walkthrough where he said something so subtly, I think most people wouldn't have picked up on it. Since applying this technique, it has drastically changed the quality of my mixes. CLA is mentioned in this video, if an effect isn't doing something, EQ it and make it do something. This is such a powerful way to use the tools we already have. I know so many of my students will throw a reverb, a delay, or some other effect on a parallel bus, and then the effect starts drowning out other elements of the mix. By EQing the gunk out, you can have the effect sitting better in the production, or maybe you're not getting enough excitement from the effect, add some top in. Use EQ to add excitement and clarity to your effects. It's that simple. This next one intimidates so many beginner and even experienced mixers. Everyone always asks when this technique should be applied and how much of it to apply, and the answer is always the unsatisfactory, 
Depends. I first heard of this technique from the Lord of the Mix himself. I was watching an interview where he said he rides the faders until the part of the mix is right. And by riding the faders on the console is how he's able to get his mixes done quickly. I had no idea what riding the faders meant. I mean, he was on a console, I was on an iMac. Then I came to find out he was referring to automation. And once I heard the word automation, it seemed every producer and mixer would always say how something was done by automating it. And it's actually one of the most powerful tricks pros use to hook listeners. Automating allows for sections of the song to flow in and out smoothly, like waves in an ocean. However, there is no guide on how to automate. It just comes down to feeling what is emotionally correct for the song. Maybe the guitars need to come down a bit for a few bars. Maybe the vocal needs less reverb and delay. Listen back and if something isn't moving you the way you want it to move the listener, automate it. Automating won't cost you a penny and it is a skill that will have artists and most importantly, their fans loving the songs and having them on repeat. And these are all great techniques to apply to your own productions, but are completely worthless unless you develop the right habits that will enhance your mixing. And you'll want to watch this video right here where I give you insight on some more things pros are doing that most mixers aren't. If you've gotten this far, you're like most dedicated mixers, you've taken diligent notes on the brilliant mix tricks shared in this compilation. And while these tricks can elevate your mix and are invaluable, they aren't the entire solution. These tricks are just pieces of a larger puzzle of getting you that professional sounding mix you covet. But there are some mistakes mixers make at all levels that keep their mixes sounding less than desirable. Which is why you'll wanna watch this video right here where pro mixers reveal what mistakes many mixers make that are keeping them from getting those pro sounding results.